Recording in progress. Okay, okay. Huh? Okay. Now, let's start the revision class. I think most of you guys will be having your WA soon. If you cannot hear me, let me know. Uh, speak slightly louder. So most of you guys will be having your WA soon, which means it's sort of like the first exam for this year. Lah. But WA is usually graded like, I think, 15%. So although it's graded, still take it a little bit more seriously. Okay? Okay, just a show of hand who is doing QA for WA. Everyone? QA is... Uh, I... Okay, so uh, I'll start off revision with QA first, then Redox. What about Redoxes? Who is doing Redox for Q, uh, WA? Almost everyone. Okay, then what about reactivity? Metals. Okay, Ken. So the topics I've chosen because they are one of the more common topics that most of you are being tested on. So I hope you guys at least take something back home from today's lesson. But just take note, uh, today's lesson is not going to repeat whatever your teacher has already taught you guys. Supposedly, you have supposed to already known that content. We're going to look into things that your teacher has not yet taught or probably don't want you to, uh, not say don't want you to know, but hope that you guys find it out yourself, Okay. So let's take a look at for QA first. For those who have already done QA in school, this is probably easier for you to understand. But for those who have not, it is still possible to do this type of question, which is your ionic equations. Okay? For those who have already done QA in school, I believe you all know that QA is all about identifying ions, all right? Unknown substances, because that's what chemists do. If you all don't realize, chemists likes to find out things that are unknown and then find out what they are made up of. I mean, usually chemists work in what? Forensic science, correct? Data collection. So these are things that we are... Hello. Are you here for the class? Okay. Is there any more space? No more. And, but I don't <laughs> Okay, okay. Now, let's carry on. So, I believe for those who have done QA in school, you already know how to do, find tests for essentially your cat ions as well as your N ions, correct? Because that was what QA is all about, doing tests to identify cat ions and N ions. And the only reason why we are so focused about cat ions and N ions is because our unknown substance is usually made up of a salt. And salts are always formed using a cat ion as well as an N ion. Okay? And that's why your QA revolved around the test for these two. Now, just to do a very quick recap, to test for cat ions, we will always add only these two substances, aqueous sodium hydroxide or add aqueous ammonium. Okay? So take note. Huh? The moment you see inside your QA flow chart, there is addition of aqueous hydro sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia, then that is a hint that they are testing for cat ions. Clear? Yeah? But if they add any other thing else, especially for N ions, if they were to add things like your dilute acids, that's a hint for you that they are testing your N ions. If they add things like silver something, okay, or they add things like barium something, then that's a hint that they are testing for the N ions. Clear? Yeah? Okay, now, do you need to memorize the QA table? Technically, yes, because it helps you in understanding the flow chart kind of questions. But for my students, I usually try not to get them to memorize because there's way too many things to memorize. 
So one trick I get them, it's a little bit of cheating by the way. One trick I get them is go to popular and then buy color pencils that uh, corresponds to the color pencils of your cat ions as well as your N ions. And then for that particular pencils, right? This video is recorded about whatever. Lah. That particular pen or that pencil, right? You just highlight the symbols in the pen. I mean, because all pens have letters, words written into them, right? So for example, FE2 plus is dirty green. I'll get them to buy a green pen and then find the letter F and E inside the pen and then just highlight them. Okay, so in the exam, if you can't remember, at least they look at the pen, they know the color. Here, that's a little bit of, that's a little bit of cheating, but it's a white cheat, like, you know, just like how a white light is like that. So it only works for students who cannot memorize really your QA table. Uh. Okay, if you can, still go and remember QA table, because the one later during the O level, a bunch of you guys are taking out pens and just figuring out what your pens are trying to do. Understand? Okay, so that's what I usually advise them to do. Now, the next part under QA is once you have identified all your colors, you have recognized all your cat ions, that part is uh, done. A questions or questions that they like to ask in the O level is asking you to write out ionic equations or chemical equations for that particular flow charge, right? Sometimes they will, they will specify a specific reaction. Sometimes they don't. They will ask you to write reactions for any of the reactions happening. So it's very important for you to know how to write what we call ionic equations. Okay, let me give you guys an example. This is actually your table for your anions, whereby I want to test for carbonate, chloride, iodide, nitrate, and sulfate. Okay, writing ionic equation means, for example, for nitrate. What is the test for nitrate? Do you all still remember? Without looking at barium. Nitrate. Nitrate, what do we add, guys? Silver. Yes, correct. Always remember nitrate, the N is very similar to ammonium, the N, nitrogen. So in yeah, ammonium, yeah, yeah, yeah. aqueous sodium hydroxide, correct? So same thing for nitrate, we add aqueous sodium hydroxide, just that this additional one, we add aluminium foil and then we warm it carefully. The results is the same for both your Ammonia gas is being given off. Understand? Now, for this particular reaction, because I'm reacting with sodium hydroxide, the ionic equation is as such. My nitrate react with OH minus together with aluminium and water produces ammonia gas and what we call a complex ion, aluminium hydroxide. Now, take note, this will not ask, they won't ask you in exam unless your school decides to be a little bit cooler. So we just put it there for um those kind of schools lah. but essentially they can still ask you the ionic equations for all the other substances so we take a look at the first one carbonate when carbonate reacts with acid it produces carbon dioxide now what would the ionic equation be obviously we have carbonate right co3 so CO3, 2 minus, aqueous. Now, plus, dilute acid. Acid is usually given in what kind of um, ionic symbol? H plus, very good. So H plus, aqueous as well. Nothing else that we are added, what do we form? Carbonate plus acid gives you? Carbon dioxide, what else? Water, and what else? and your salt, correct? But for ionic equation, because your salt is an aqueous solution, so by right, they will be cancelled out. So you only leave behind solids and liquids, okay? So in that case, this is my ionic equation for carbonate. All I got to do is just balance the chemical equation. Okay, clear? Okay, so this is the equation for carbonates and acid should they ask. The next one, chloride. What happens when chlor how do we test for chloride? Chlorides is the same as testing for bromide, also the same as testing for iodide. Basically, all your halides, group seven elements. Can we mute the person who is. Sorry, Kobe. <laughs> Okay, so say, like as I said, chlorides, bromides, iodides, they are all halides. So to test for group 7 halides, it's the same test. We first add 
dilute nitric acid, and then silver nitrate. Okay, one question, why do we need to add acid first? Why can't we just straight away add silver nitrate? Has anybody asked you guys this question before? What's the answer? Harbor? Me. Okay, so if you realize if they say acidified with dilute acid, acidified with dilute acid, usually it is because they want you to eliminate carbonate. Understand? CO3 2 minus. So that if you are testing only for chlorides, the silver nitrate will be the one that is testing for chlorides and not for carbonates. Understand? Okay. So when questions or in notes come up like that, right? You guys need to learn how to ask yourself why. Don't just accept the fact. Understand? Because sometimes teacher can just teach you one whole year, it could be a wrong fact. Okay, so learn to ask questions why. So to add dilute nitric acid is to eliminate CO2. Now take note, because I added nitric acid, that's why I use silver nitrate. If I added dilute sulfuric acid, I have to change to silver sulfate. Understand? Okay, so it's uh, corresponding with, together with the acid. Then you'll get a white PPT. Same for iodide. If I add dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate, I get a yellow PPT. What about the in-between bromide? The test is still the same, but what PPT do I get? Color theory. White, yellow, what's in between? Huh? White, yellow, what's in between? All the girls should know that we have many different colors of one color one. Blue, got Tiffany blue, coral blue, bright blue, neon blue. What's in between white and yellow? Huh? Pale yellow. You can call it pale yellow or being a little bit more girly, cream color. Okay? Or beige color. Understand? So brown bromide will give you a cream PPT. Sometimes instead of cream, what do they use? A fancy, more fanciful name. Off-white PPT. Yeah. Okay? So it's not white, white, but it's slightly off-white. If you all do renovation next time, you all paint your house, right? Many different versions of white. Pearl white, Elizabeth white, Orchid lily, all this kind of color. Okay? Okay. So what would the ionic equation be? Guys, guys, what would the ionic equation be? First things first, chloride. Plus, now think about it. What is the precipitate that you are forming here? AgCl. So this is the precipitate that you are having. Now, ask yourself, what are the ions that form AgCl? Ag plus as well as Cl minus. So this would be your ionic equation. Which means to say, can you all write one for iodide? I minus equals plus Ag plus equals gives you AgI. Solid. Okay, understand? Now, the next one, sulfate. So what's the test for sulfate? Sulfate test very straightforward, always together with barium. Why? Insoluble salt, insoluble sulfate salts. What are your insoluble sulfate salts? Lead, barium, and calcium. Your LBC, little black cat, little black, whatever y'all want to call it. Lah. Okay, I remember yes, little black cat. Lah. I have a things against cats. So everything I remember, I remember with respect to cats. Okay? So lead, barium, calcium. Now, I need you guys to take note of this uh, because when we test for calcium yes, we do barium nitrate. But if the question decided to change to lead nitrate, is it still possible? Yes. Because lead 2 nitrate is also insoluble. You understand? So don't be too fixated on what the facts gives you. If I say barium sulfate, doesn't mean that I die, die need to use barium sulfate. If I change a bit to calcium sulfate, this test is still possible. You understand? So in that case here, how, what is the white precipitate form? If I use barium sulfate, barium, uh, if I use barium nitrate, barium sulfate. So I ask myself, what is the ion that forms barium sulfate? BA. 2 plus equals together with sulfate. What sulfate ion? 
SO4, 2 minus, correct. Okay, so these are the ionic equations you write for the, those specific reactions that you have. Understand? Okay, clear? So in summary, what can we say for our N ions? Number one, silver, we usually use to test what kind of I, uh, cation, uh, so what kind of anions? Chloride, what else? Iodide, what else? Bromide, your halides, correct? Now, there are something else that there are some more cat anions that we use to silver to test with. Hydroxides, as well as your carbonates. So these are the ones that usually forms your insoluble precipitates. Okay? Next, for barium, barium usually forms precipitates with sulfate, correct? What else? Calcium. Oh, sorry, not calcium, carbonate. Okay? And then to acidify with dilute acid, what do we use it to remove? Earlier on, we say carbonates, one more, hydroxides. Yeah? Now, if you're wondering why is hydroxide even in the picture, because you have to understand that even though I have a substance with hydroxide, I am not necessarily an alkaline, which means an aqueous solution. Not all hydroxides are soluble. The ones that are soluble are group 1 and barium. So those don't form precipitate. But any other hydroxides, iron 2 hydroxide, zinc 2 hydroxides, aluminium hydroxides, they are all insoluble. That means they form precipitates. Understand? Because I think a lot of you guys have the misconception that OH- minus definitely is an alkaline because hydroxide ma, release OH- minus ions. But that's not the case. Okay? They are basic but not alkaline. The only alkaline ones, I repeat, are group 1 hydroxides and barium hydroxide. Okay? Okay, the next one, we're going to look at the e equations to write for test for cations. So like I said, to test for cations, we only look at two reagents, aqueous sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia. Now, do you all wonder why these two? Why can't it be anyone else? Why must it be aqueous sodium hydroxide and aqueous ammonia? What do these two provide that allows you to form precipitate with your cat ions? I write down the equation, huh? aqueous hydroxide, correct? Sodium hydroxide, aqueous ammonia. But aqueous ammonia, the chemical equation should be in this manner. NH4 plus and OH minus. Okay? Before we move on, I need you guys to take note, aqueous ammonia is not ammonium hydroxide. Two different things. Huh? Aqueous ammonia is a ammonia plus water gives me NH4 plus and OH minus. Okay? Now what do you all realize there is something in common between these two reagents? The what? OH minus. Remember just now what did I say? Hydroxides, not all of them are soluble, except for group 1s and barium, they rest all form precipitate. So your main goal is to make the metal cat ion react with this hydroxide so that they form a precipitate that you can see, you can observe, to identify. Can you see that? That's why we add a sodium hydroxide or aqueous ammonia. Okay? So... You, to remember the cation table, I remember it based on table. You guys may have some form of, um, uh, based on colors, you guys may have some form of uh, other ways to memorize or no choice, go and buy your pen and highlight the, the, the alphabets there. Lah, okay? But for me, how I remember it is I remember it based on color. So those that form white precipitates would actually be aluminum, calcium, zinc. Last time, there was a lead, but it's taken out of syllabus already, so you don't have to remember lead. So for me, how I remembered it was previously, right, that forms white precipitate. Because like I said, I don't really like cats. I'm a dog person. So I remember it as all cat zones prohibited. That's how I remember it for myself, okay? 
Any cat zones prohibited. So that's how I remember it has white precipitate. Okay, for you guys, find uh, your uh, best method for you to remember the cat ions white precipitate. But like I said, I try to remember it based on colors. I don't remember it based on aluminum must be white, ammonia must be this, calcium must be this. Okay, can? Okay, so like I said, this content is already taught to you in school. What they don't usually teach you is how to write the ionic equation should that reaction happen. So always remember, whatever precipitate that you see inside your cat ion table for QA, all precipitates are hydroxides here. So all precipitates formed are hydroxides or more accurately are the metal hydroxides. The metal that you are testing for and together with the OH minus. So which means to say, whatever metal cat ion you have, the by default ionic equation would be the metal cat ion by itself equals solution plus your hydroxide ion equals solution forms your metal hydroxide. Solid. Okay. We write a general statement because that is applicable to all the metal cat ion here except for ammonium. Okay, now what about ammonium? Ammonium is the only one that reacts with sodium hydroxide and not aqueous ammonia. Because if you think about it, if you want to test for ammonium and you add ammonia, it kind of defeats the purpose, right? You're testing what you're adding. So therefore, we only use sodium hydroxide. Okay, so it forms ammonia gas, which means to say in your ionic equation, you know that there is ammonium present and you know that the product, there is NH3 gas. Now in between, what will be added? First things first, you are adding sodium hydroxide. And sodium hydroxide, what you want is OH minus aqueous. Okay? Then from there, you will form your ammonia gas together with... Anyone want to guess what's the next product? Water, correct. H2O. Okay? So if you have not yet written an ionic equation for ammonium, this would be the one. Yeah? Okay, now, the next one, once we are all done, everyone done? Now, let's take a look at the test for gases now. The test for gases, like I said, your school would have probably gone through this with you. You have probably done experiments regarding this as well. Just remember to test for oxygen, glowing spleen. How I remember it? G-O. To test for hydrogen, lighted spleen. How I remember it? You know your HL milk? Yeah. Okay. So go buy HL milk. That's how I remember it. Lah. Okay. So if you cannot remember, uh, this is what, uh, how, how I do it. Okay? Now, probably the next harder one would actually be sulfur dioxide because you are not very used to sulfur dioxide being in your school laboratory only because it's a toxic gas. So very hard for you to test or see it in real life. Okay. But for sulfur dioxide, we use aqueous acidified potassium manganate. What's the rationale? Because sulfur dioxide is actually a reducing agent. And aqueous acidified potassium manganate is an oxidizing agent. So for those who do redox, you would know that if there is a redox happening, there would be a color change. So to test for my reducing agent, I use an oxidizing agent. That's why I use acidified potassium manganate. And manganate is purple to colorless. Understand? Okay, so that's the one that we uh, use to, to test. Next thing, ammonia gas is something that I want you guys to bring your attention to because ammonia gas is the only alkaline gas that you know in your entire syllabus. I repeat, uh, any gas that they say turns red litmus paper blue is ammonia because ammonia is the only alkaline gas that you know in your syllabus. All other gases are either acidic or neutral. Okay, clear?
Okay, next thing, carbon dioxide. I know all of you guys know carbon dioxide reacts with lime water to give you white precipitate. What are the chemical formulas? Does anyone know what's the lime water chemical formula? Calcium what? Calcium hydroxide. Okay, then what about the white precipitate that is formed? Calcium carbonate, correct. So calcium hydroxide will react with carbon dioxide to form calcium carbonate. These are the chemical equations involved. Understand? No more writing milky color. Or oh, you are not p 6 ers ah. Your answer needs to be a little bit more sophisticated. Understand? Okay. Or oh, what? Lime water turns chalky or cloudy. Those are what they write in primary school lah. Okay. Okay. So those are the tests for guesses. Any question? No ah. Okay. Assuming you guys are now better understanding of your QA, can we go to question 11 first? Okay, question 11 is a prelim question that involves QA. So I give you guys seven minutes to finish the whole question. Then I'll go through. So try it out first.
Okay, then can I go through? Is it hard? Suddenly you realize why is green there when there wasn't even green to be, uh, there's no iron, correct? This is where your color concept has to come in, which is all the colors that you need to remember in terms of substances wise. I have a summary sheet for my students for colors. Okay, don't need to take this. Color. I printed for you guys already, data I'll take for you guys. Bring that back. Keep that as your Bible or whatever. Sleep it, burn it, make copies of it, drink it. Remember these colors for all the different sorts and precipitate. Okay? But let's take a look at the one for green. Obviously, iron 2 is green. So most of the solutions as well as precipitate for irons is considered to be green. But do you all realize something else are also green in color? Copper 2 carbonate is also green. Understand? Okay, so don't have the misconception that copper is also uh, blue, always blue, clear? So copper to carbonate is always green. Now, there is one substance that is also green that is not listed here, that would be calcium, which is something that is actually found inside your question here, okay? So let's talk about this question here first. Aqueous solution of sodium carbonate. Can we write down all the chemical formulas as we go? What is sodium carbonate's chemical formula? Quick one. Na2CO3. No S, huh? Okay. Na2CO3. Next one. Calcium hydroxide. Just CaOH. OH2. Next. Copper 2 chloride. 
CuCl2 silver nitrate. AgNO3, correct. Now they are stored in four bottles labeled A, B, C, D, not necessary in that order. A class of pupils was instructed to carry out the following procedures, and these are what we get. Now, what is going on in this entire experiment here is actually what we call displacement, or in short, double displacement. Now, double displacement means, right, your two salts, when they react together, they just swap their cations and anions with each other. Understand? Usually, the reason we do double uh, displacement is because we want to have a precipitation reaction going on. So, you learned it as precipitation because one of the salt produced will have to be a solid. Understand? So, the colors that you are seeing is actually all the precipitate that has been formed. Yeah? Now, first things first, they mix A with B. So, for A with B, a white precipitate is observed. If you guys don't already know, most of your metals precipitate are white except transition metals. Transition metals tend to form colored compounds. Any other metal, they tend to form white color compounds. Okay? So this white precipitate dissolves when dilute hydrochloric acid is added, which means this precipitate reacts with acid. What are the substances that reacts with acids? What are the substances that react with acid? Your cash, your mesh, and your bash. Mesh, bash, cash. If y'all cannot remember, huh? bash is base plus acid, salt plus H2O. Get it? B-A-S-H. Base plus acid, salt plus H2O. Mesh is metal plus acid, salt plus hydrogen. Then cash is carbonate plus acid, salt, water, and extra C, carbon dioxide. Because everyone's prefer extra cash. Understand? That's how you remember the equations if you cannot remember the acid equation. Okay, I repeat. Ah, your mesh, bash, cash. Mesh is, a uh, bash is, Base plus acid gives you salt plus water, H2O. Mesh is metal plus acid gives you salt plus hydrogen gas, H. Cash is carbonate plus acid gives you salt plus water, plus extra cash, extra carbon dioxide. Understand? So if you all cannot remember the acid equations, these three are the one, your mesh, bash, cash. Clear? Okay. Okay, so what kind of precipitate will then react with your high dilute hydrochloric acid? Does a base metal or a carbonate sounds like a precipitate to you? Either a base or carbonate, correct? So most likely one of your mixture here has a carbonate present because there is or a hydroxide present. That's how we recognize these two. Do you all understand? So A or B, one could be a carbonate, one could be a hydroxide. Do you understand? Okay, but we don't know yet. So never mind. We just write down here first to remind ourselves. Then move on to the next one. The next one, A and C. So maybe we can identify what A is. Now, it says that when I mix A and C together, a green precipitate is observed. This green precipitate dilute hydrochloric acid added, it dissolves. Same thing. That means this precipitate could be a carbonate or a hydroxide. Understand? Why? Okay, I repeat. Huh? They said that a green precipitate is observed. The green precipitate dissolves when added an acid. So, precipitate reacts with acid will be dissolved. Either a carbonate or a Hydroxide. I see that? Same and reasoning as the earlier one. What? Why would this precipitate dissolve when you add HCl? Because it could either be a carbonate or a hydroxide. Definitely not a metal because a metal is not a precipitate. Right? So you know that for this, when I mix A with C, I get a carbonate or a hydroxide. Then you ask yourself, which carbonate, which hydroxide is green in color? Which hydroxide, which carbonate is green in color? 
iron to hydroxide. But is there an option for you to have iron to? No. So what's another precipitate that is green? Copper to carbonate. But copper to carbonate has to be a solid. So the only answer for this case here is calcium. Calcium hydroxide, sorry, calcium carbonate is also green in color. Okay, so now adding to your database of colors, calcium carbonate is green in, oh, sorry, copper. Wait, wait, let me repeat myself. Okay, I read myself. Uh. Your green precipitate has to either be what? Cop carbonate or hydroxide. The only hydroxides and carbonate that you know that is green in color is either iron to hydroxide or iron to carbonate. That's one, correct? But there is no iron in this question here, so scrape that. Which means, what are the only carbonates and hydroxides that are green? You are left with copper, correct? Which means to say, inside this solution here, there is a copper as well. Can you all see that? Can you all see that? Which means to say, right, which is definitely A or C, copper to chloride. You understand? So A or C could be copper 2 chloride. So I kind of solve the mystery here that one of them will be copper 2 chloride. Now, let's say if A is copper 2 chloride, uh, let's say, for example, A is copper 2 chloride, what forms copper 2 chloride to get a white precipitate? Remember, we need either a carbonate or a hydroxide. So if we, let's say, we put sodium carbonate, okay, B is sodium carbonate. Now, is copper 2 carbonate a white precipitate? No. If sodium chloride a white precipitate? No, it's a solution. Right? So, okay, carbonate out. What about the hydroxide? Let's say this is calcium hydroxide. Is calcium chloride a white precipitate? Is calcium chloride a white precipitate? Yes or no? Have you all done salts? All chlorides are soluble except for lead, two chloride, and silver. So is calcium chloride a precipitate? No. So calcium chloride cannot. Copper two hydroxide, is it a precipitate? Yes. But is it white in color? No. So therefore, calcium hydroxide don't work, which means my A cannot be copper chloride. Anybody need me to repeat? Okay, I repeat. Uh. Listen uh, carefully. Uh. Guys, guys. Now, for solution two, okay, the only thing I know is this precipitate reacts with acid. What kind of precipitate reacts with acid? Carbonates or hydroxides, correct? Now, what carbonates and what hydroxides are green in color? If you go to your table, the hydroxide that is green in color, iron. Carbonate that is green in color, iron or copper. Agree? Which means inside my solution here needs to either have iron or copper. But my option doesn't have iron. So I'm only left with copper. So for sure, I know in these two, there is a copper chloride. Clear? Now, what is another clue that I have? A and A. So I tell myself, let's do, let's assume A is copper 2 chloride. Okay? Now, to mix with B and form a white precipitate that dissolves with acid, I need to form either a carbonate, react with a carbonate or a hydroxide. That means my B, my B needs to have a carbonate or a hydroxide. Do you all agree? Looking at our options, what are the carbonates? Number one, sodium 2 carbonate. So I ask myself, does sodium 2 carbonate react with copper chloride to form a white precipitate? See, ah? copper 2 carbonate, is it a white precipitate? No. Sodium chloride, is it a white precipitate? No. So therefore, sodium carbonate is out. Next, hydroxides from my option, calcium hydroxide. So, calcium hydroxide here. Calcium chloride, is it a white precipitate? No. Copper 2 hydroxide, is it a white precipitate? 
No. So therefore, what does this tell me? This tell me A cannot be copper 2 chloride. A has to be something else. Do you all understand? So based on now part 2, A makes you C to form a green precipitate. I know my green precipitate is what? Copper 2 carbonate. This tells me that A has a carbonate in it. Correct? What is the only carbonate option in your list here? Sodium carbonate. Do you understand? So that means A here is also sodium carbonate. Clear? Repeat which part? Why A is sodium carbonate? Okay. Do you all understand why C is copper 2 chloride? Yes. So remember, if let's say I already know what my C is, what is my green precipitate form? Copper 2 carbonate, right? That means I need someone with a carbonate here. Because I already have the copper here. So who is the one with the carbonate here from your list? Sodium. Because remember, acid reacts with what? Carbonate, metal, and bases. They say the precipitate reacts with your acid. What forms precipitate? Carbonate or hydroxide. A metal is not a precipitate. Understand? Huh? Are you asking me why is metal not a precipitate? Are you really asking me that? <laughs> no, what's a precipitate? Guys, what's a precipitate? <laughs> Guys, what's a precipitate? A precipitate has to be a... No, no, what is a precipitate, guys? A salt. A precipitate has to be a salt. Understand? So why is metal not a precipitate? Because metals are not salt. Understand? Okay? Get it now? Okay, guys. So we know our A, we know our C. Okay. Let's take a look at D right now. C and D. Let's see if we can find something from there. It says here, a white precipitate is formed in a blue solution. This one quite obvious already, right? <coughs> Who gives the blue solution? Copper. So the copper chloride is responsible for your blue solution. This also tells you that your copper 2 chloride is in excess. That's why there is a blue solution remaining. Understand? Next, the precipitate does not dissolve when dilute hydrochloric acid is added. What does that also tell you? The precipitate is neither a carbonate nor, nor it is a hydroxide. I repeat, your acid test for hydroxides and carbonates. If the precipitate don't dissolve, that means your precipitate is neither a carbonate nor a hydroxide. Do you understand? So you need to choose a salt that don't form carbonate or hydroxide. And what salt it is? It's quite obvious now already, which is your silver nitrate. So A... D is silver nitrate. That leaves us with B to be what? Calcium hydroxide. Do you understand now how this whole thing works? Okay, clear? Okay, good. So write all the uh, solutions down in your answer key here. Okay? Now, the only thing I need you guys to do this in exam, do it fast enough. Okay? So think faster. But when you read the question, read slower. So you don't miss out anything. But do questions, think faster. Okay? Can I? Okay, now let's move on. Once you guys have understood, next, construct the ionic equation with state symbols for the formation of the precipitate form. So let's take a look at test one. Now, what is the precipitate form in test one? Who is the white precipitate here? 
Is it sodium hydroxide? Is it sodium hydroxide? No, no huh? why? Sodium hydroxide is soluble, correct. Is it calcium carbonate? Yes, so calcium carbonate, white in color. So that means I form calcium carbonate here, solid. What are the ions that form calcium carbonate? Ca, 2 plus, as well as carbonate, CO3, 2 minus. Okay, so form ionic equation is actually quite straightforward. You find out what is the solid liquid of the gas form, then write the ions that result in them. Okay, you don't have to go through the entire process of writing the balanced chemical equation, splitting the ions, cancelling, then get your ionic equation. Clear? Okay, the next one, test two. Done, everyone, for test one. Now, for test two, what is the green precipitate form here? Copper carbonate. So, copper carbonate, CuCO3, solid. What are the ions that form copper carbonate? Copper, 2 plus, as well as CO3, 2 minus. Okay. Now, the last one. What is the last precipitate that is being formed? White precipitate that doesn't dissolve. Is it copper 2 nitrate? Is copper 2 nitrate a white precipitate? No, it is a blue solution. It's a blue solution. Understand? Is silver chloride a white precipitate? Yes. yes. So therefore, the precipitate formed here, silver chloride, solid. You have Ag plus and Cl minus. Okay, is this question easy? Yes. Yes. Confidence is key. Okay, confidence is half the battle one. Okay, now, done with QAR. Let's take a look at the next one now. Redox. Okay, can we flip back to the notes side, the summary notes night, and we take a look at Redox. Okay, now for redox, guys, for redox reaction, it's basically reactions that involves reduction and oxidation. Hence, the, the name redox came out, red ox, correct? Now, what I need you guys to remember is redox is not like a chapter by itself. It's like more. It can happen for anything, okay? So most chemical equations is either a reduction equation, an oxidizing equation, or both, a redox equation. Clear? So to find out whether the equation undergoes redox, you have to understand whether the substance undergo oxidation or reduction. Clear? Now what's your host, the H-O-S-E here? Basically, H would be hydrogen, oxygen, electrons, and oxidation state. Okay, so this actually helps to describe whether your reaction undergoes redux, reduction, oxidation, or redox. Okay, based on your memory, and you guys tell me, usually I don't remember both. I remember one, then I uh, the other one is opposite. Then just choose the one that you remember. I pretty much like positive stuff, so I remember oxidation. I don't really like remember reduction. Okay, so up to you guys. But let's go through these first things first. Oxidation, in terms of oxidation state, increase or decrease? Increase, correct. Okay, which means for reduction, oxidation state, decrease. Next one, hydrogen. Gain or lose? Oxidation, gain or lose hydrogen? Lose. I mean, it's quite obvious from the name, right? Oxidation means? gain oxygen. That's why oxygen gain. 
Then the opposite, gain for hydrogen reduction, loss in oxygen reduction. Okay. Now, the next one, guys, electrons. For oxidation, do I gain or lose electrons? You sure? No. <laughs> gain or lose electrons for oxidation? What about reduction? Now, do you all know why the rationale is just pure memory? Do you all know why lose electrons is oxidized, gain electrons is reduced? Don't know why? It's actually linked to your oxidation state. Let me explain. Huh? Imagine I have an atom. Guys, imagine I have an atom. If I lose electron, my atom goes as a product. Correct? My electron becomes a product. What happens to my atom? Do I become positively charged or negatively charged? I lose electron, huh? positively charged. Look at the oxidation state. What happens? Increase. That's why losing electrons oxidized. Understand? What happens if now I'm an atom? I gain electron. Gaining electron means it's now a reactant. What happens when I gain a negative charge, guys? I become negatively charged. So look at the oxidation state. What happens? Decrease. Do you understand? Okay. Is there a need to memorize? No. I never memorize in chemistry. I reason it out myself. Understand? Okay. You explain to yourself why things happen like that. Okay, good. So once we have understood that, any equation can be deduced to be oxidized, reduced, or redox by any of the properties here. Okay? Which means to say, can we take a look at this equation here? Guys, take a look at this equation. Copper reacting with silver nitrate to form copper 2 nitrate and silver. Is this a redox reaction? Yes? How do you all know it's a redox reaction? Okay, now before we move on even further, let's try to, guys, let's try to deduce from the oxidation state root. Okay, first things first, what's copper oxidation state? Good, why is copper oxidation state zero? It's an element, all elements zero. Huh? Next, silver nitrate. What's the oxidation state for silver? Plus one. Now, guys, how do I know that silver is plus one? Usually for any ionic compound, I will split it up into its ion, cation, and anion. Then I'll take the charge. So for silver, Ag plus, that's why it's plus one. Understand? Now for nitrogen, what's the oxidation state for nitrogen? Minus what? Minus one. What's the oxidation state for nitrogen? How do I calculate from here? I let nitrogen be X. What's the oxidation state for oxygen? Minus 2. This is equal to minus 1. I repeat, uh, to find unknown oxidation state, let it be X. Plus, there's 3 oxygen. Oxygen is minus 2 oxidation state for sure. The total oxidation state add up to be negative 1. So then to calculate this, this is plus 5. Get it? So nitro, uh, nitrogen here plus 5, oxygen minus 2. Okay? Moving on. Copper. Copper in copper 2 nitrate. What is the oxidation state? Guys, what's the oxidation state for copper in copper 2 nitrate? 2 plus, correct. Because Cu2 plus, NO3 minus. So this is plus 2. What about the nitrogen here? What's the oxidation state? Is it the same as before? NO3 minus? No? Isn't it the same NO3 minus? Is it the same NO3 minus? Does the two here matters? No. Oxidation state, the mole ratio don't matter at all. Understand? So in that case here, plus five, minus two. 
Lastly, silver. What's the oxidation state for silver? Zero. Is this a redox? Yes. Copper increased from Cu to Cu2 plus. Silver decreased from Ag plus to Ag. You understand? Okay, so this is how we use oxidation state to determine whether it's the redox or not. A quick one. Same thing in exam. Just do it fast enough. Get it? Okay. Now, next. Ionic equation, what would it be? Remember, we are keeping our solid present. So, copper solid plus, here I will have silver solid. What are the ions that I can, I can cancel? Like ions, nitrate, nitrate. So, I'm left with 2Ag aqueous plus and Cu2 plus aqueous. From the ionic equation, you guys can also very quickly see who is oxidized, who is reduced. Understand? So who is the oxidized one? Copper. Copper oxidized to form copper 2 plus, correct? Now, what is the half equation? Do you all know what are half equations? Half equations are equations with the relevant electrons involved. So what must copper do to form copper 2 plus? Add two electrons. Lose two electrons. So the electrons at the back. Understand? So for silver, silver plus is being reduced to form what? Silver solid. So what must silver do to become a solid silver? gain one electron. Okay? Now, do you all know how they form the balanced chemical equation from the half equation? How did they get this equation here if I were to give you the half equations? Always remember, in any chemical reaction, the number of electrons lose has to be equal to the number of electrons gained. So, if I lose two electrons, I need to gain two electrons. So to balance the chemical equation, I have to times two. Do you understand? That's why when you merge them, your silver 2Ag plus. Do you all get it? So if you are given a half equation, always tell yourself to form the overall chemical equation, make the number of electrons the same. Because the number of electrons lost equals to the number of electrons gained. Understand? Okay. Okay, so from the half equations, from the overall equation, to write standard statements uh, for your balancing of uh, for your structured questions would be who is being oxidized? Copper. Okay. Uh wait, maybe I write the full term. Copper is oxidized as then we say each Cu atom loses two electrons to form copper two plus ions. You know, there are some questions that always like to say, explain in terms of electrons, who is oxidized. The standard answer key is like that. Who is oxidized as what atom gains or lose how many electrons to form what? Understand? Same thing, if it's reduced, we say silver, uh, uh, maybe this one I write silver ions is reduced as each silver plus ion gains one electrons to form Ag atoms. Okay, clear? Now, the next one, what happens if the question say, explain in terms of oxidation state, who is being reduced, who is being oxidized? So we say, in this case here, copper is oxidized. Guys, copper is oxidized as the oxidation state of copper increases from zero in copper to plus two in Cu2 plus. Okay, you need to state the oxidation state number and especially in what substance. You cannot just say copper is oxidized because oxidation state increased. Full stop. They want to set that as an answer. 
Okay, same for silver. We say that silver, but when we say silver is being reduced, we don't just say silver. We need to say silver in what reactant? Because the silver came from silver nitrate. So the silver in silver nitrate is being reduced as the oxidation state of silver decreased from plus one in Ag plus to zero in Ag. Understand? So now when you all write down, please write down the proper sentence. Don't just write half-hearted answers. Huh? Okay, so who is the oxidizing agent? The oxidizing agent is always the one that oxidizes others, but they themselves get reduced. But we say that silver nitrate is the oxidizing agent. Don't just say it's silver. It's the whole element that is the oxidizing agent. Understand? As it causes copper to undergo oxidation. Then who is the reducing agent? Copper. So copper is the reducing agent as it causes silver nitrate to undergo reduction. Understand? Okay, guys. Yeah. Okay, good. So common oxidizing agent, common reducing agent. What are they? If we leave it blank there, what does that mean? You need to remember. Okay, what are your common oxidizing agents? KMnO4, potassium manganate. Okay, but don't forget, it needs to be acidified. If you just throw a random KMnO4 there, it will not work. It needs to be acidified. Usually, we acidify by adding sulfuric acid. Okay, now before we move on, what is the colors for KMnO4? Purple to colorless, good. Next one, what is a slightly weaker oxidizing agent? Yeah? Oxidize? Where? Oh. Basically, it's oxidation but went wrong. What? Yeah? Eh? You know, I have to be one head ahead in front of you guys. So I'm thinking of the next answer when I'm already writing the answer. So that's why I was spell wrong. And I was talking to my student about durian and I literally wrote durian and the answer key. Okay, the next one. What is another weaker oxidizing agent? Again, again. Yes, what do we call that? Acidified? Guys, what is this one? Potassium dichromate. Okay. What is the colors for potassium dichromate? Yes, good. Orange to green. So the moment you see these two, straight away, you know it's an oxidizing agent. Now there is one more less commonly used oxidizing agent, or rather not a lot of people think that they are oxidizing agent. These are your halogens. What's the rationale? Halogens are group what element? 17. Group 17 element means they tend to form cations or anions. That means they are easily reduced. So if they're easily reduced, they easily oxidize other people. You understand? That's why they are good oxidizing agent. Need me to repeat again? No need, huh? Okay, next. What are your good reducing agents? That is why it's a very common reducing agent. Potassium iodide. Very good. Ki. Okay, Ki is a very good Reducing agent, what is the color change? Yes, what is the brown color? Yes, good. The next one, what's a common reducing agent? Sulfur dioxide, okay. What is another reducing agent that is very good? Obviously, hydrogen, right? Because you add hydrogen atoms, so hydrogen, good reducing agent. Clear? 
Now the last one, think about it. If halogens are good oxidizing agents, what is the other extreme? Yes, so your metals are good reducing agents. Why is that so? Because they readily lose electron to form cations. So they readily undergo oxidation. Understand? Okay, so they then themselves is oxidized to reduce other people. And okay, good. So, like I said, redox is a topic that can be integrated to any topic. A very good topic they like to integrate redox is, is QA. Okay, they like to integrate QA with redox, moles with redox. Next time when y'all learn electrolysis, redox will happen again. Understand? So, can we take a look at question 12? Another round of assessing yourself, being low self-esteem, and wondering if you can even go through the O level this year. But <laughs> try this. Same thing, uh, seven minutes for you guys to try. <laughs> guys, guys, try this question. Seven minutes for you guys.
Okay, guys, can I go through this question? Yes. Okay, now let's take a look at this question. Now, this one involves a little bit of a periodic table. Who hasn't done periodic table in school? Everybody done periodic table? Halogen, all of those. Okay, now let's take a look at this one. The halogen consists of elements such as chlorine, fluorine, bromine, iodine. For those of you guys who don't know, they should exist as a diatomic molecule. Understand? Halogens are all diatomic. Now, there is another version of a name that is very closely linked to halogens. What is it called? Your halide. What's the difference between halogen and halides? Yes, halides are your ionic form. So, fluoride, chloride, bromide, and iodide. Okay? Just so you guys know, no one of, on earth has yet to be able to form a fluoride ion. That means no one has been able to separate fluorine atom yet. So who knows, maybe one of you guys will be a Nobel Prize winner. Remember to credit me because I gave you guys the idea. Okay? You will be the next open hymer or probably you'll call yourself the fluorider or something. I don't know. Okay. Anyways, let's move on. Now, for this reaction, they say halogen reacts with metal to produce a wide range of salt. Compare the table to show what happens when aqueous chlorine is shaken with iron two salts. First things first, when we talk about chlorines or even your halogen, how does the reactivity go? Who is the most reactive in halogen? Fluorine followed by chlorine followed by bromine, iodine, then astatine. So for chlorine, remember, reactivity decreases down the group. Okay? So when you have a halogen trying to replace a halide, this reaction is called displacement reaction. Clear? So first things first, chlorine. Can chlorine react with iron 2 bromide? So, can chlorine react with iron 2 bromide? Yes, because chlorine is more reactive. What products do I form? Guys, what products do I form? Iron 2 chloride and bromine. Correct. Now, Guys, this bromine is what kind of bromine? Solid bromine, liquid bromine, aqueous bromine, or gaseous bromine? Gases, aqueous bromine, aqueous bromine. Understand? Huh? Because it's inside a solution. What is the color change involved here? Good. Green solution turns reddish brown. Guys, guys, who is responsible for the green solution? Iron what? Two what? Bromide or chloride? Who is responsible for the green solution to iron 2 bromide or iron 2 chloride? Bromide. Surprisingly, guys, iron 2 chloride is a white salt. It's not green. When in water, it becomes colorless. All white solution, white precipitate forms colorless solution. Understand? Okay. The reddish brown is due to bromine, your aqueous bromine. Clear? Okay, the next one, iron 2 iodide. Does it react with aqueous bromine? Uh, aqueous chloride. Chlorine. It does, right? Because chlorine is more reactive. So what do you form? Iron 2 chloride and iodine. That's why you have the brown solution. 
Okay, let's talk a little bit about iodine. What is iodine's color when it's solid? Black. What is iodine color when it is aqueous? Brown. What is iodine color when it's a gas? Purple. Oh, do you not know this? Okay, iodine. Solid. You need to know this, huh? Black. Aqueous. Brown. Gas. Purple. Iodine is purple vapor. Understand? Black solid. Liquid is brown in color. Aqueous is brown in color. Okay, now next one. Write the ionic equation when aqueous chlorine reacts with io, iron 2 bromine. So, what is aqueous chlorine? Cl2. React with iron 2 bromine. What do you have? FeBr2, correct? Aqueous. Then what does it form? FeCl2, aqueous. And then Br2, aqueous. Now, but it's ionic compound. So what must we do? We must cancel the similar ions. Fe, Fe. Clear? But take note, that means the ones that are left behind have to be in their ionic or full compound format. So 2Br equals forms 2Cl minus and Br2 equals. Okay, now the next one, explain. Why does this reaction happen? What's the principle of displacement? Yes, chlorine is more reactive than bromine. Hence, it will displace bromine from aqueous iron to bromide. To form iron to chloride and aqueous bromine. Okay, now moving on, the next part. Now guys, here, explain in terms of oxidation state. Why is the reaction a redox reaction? So B part one. Who is being reduced in this case here? Chlorine is being reduced. Who is being oxidized? Bromine. So the standard template answer is, because it's oxidation state, state their oxidation state number in from what to what, understand? So for this case here, we first have to mention that chlorine undergoes reduction. Then we mention why as the oxidation state of Cl decrease. Remember, must state the number in what substance? Cl2. 2 minus 1 in Cl minus. Okay. Next. Bromine in FeBr2. Notice it is the reactant. I will have to state the whole reactant. Undergoes oxidation as the oxidation state of Br increased from negative 1 in B FeBr2 to 0 in Br2. 
But don't just stop here because the question asks you why is it a redox? So you need the added statement since reduction and oxidation both occurred simultaneously. It is a redox reaction. Why? Oh. You can explain me you know it already. Teaching our friends is the best form of attainment of knowledge. <laughs> Obviously, they make they understand what you're trying to say, lah. We do understand what you say. It's not very. Okay, done. The next one. Identify the oxidizing agent and explain your answer in terms of electron transfer. So, who is the oxidizing agent in this reaction here? The one that undergoes reduction. So, in this case, who is it? Chlorine. Now, what happens to chlorine in terms of electron transfer? How many electrons that chlorine lost so that bromine can gain? Uh, yeah, one. Correct. Okay. So, for this one here, guys, chlorine is the oxidizing agent. As it costs Br in FeBr2 to undergo oxidation as every Br minus ion lose electrons to form bromine molecule. Okay, done. Okay, now let's move on to the last part, reactivity series, guys. Last part already, reactivity series. Now, reactivity series is something to do with your metals, correct? So, you need to remember the reactivity series for your metals. What is most reactive? Moving on to the one that is the least reactive. Now, does anyone have a problem memorizing the series? Or remembering the series? Okay, hey, now if you have difficulty, what I use is this. Please stop calling me a cute zebra. I love hot, cute, sexy giraffes. Okay? So that's how I remember it. Huh? If you guys got any other acronym, remember it your own. Yeah? But generally, what does the table... What does the table tell you? Now, I know your school teach you guys the reactivity table as this being the most reactive, this being the least reactive. But most of you guys take it for granted and not understand what really reactive means. If you think about it, if I'm a matter, what does it mean when I'm reactive? I tend to 
lose electrons. That's what being a reactive means. So if I'm more reactive, means higher up the series, I want to stay as an ion. Which means to say, right, in any circumstances, if I get the chance to react, to become an ion, I will do it. You understand? But if I am at the least reactive portion, this part here, I do not want to behave as an ion. Best, I want to stay as an atom. That means I don't want to lose my electrons easily. I want to stay as my ground state. That's what being reactive means. Here, for a metal. If you're talking for a halogen, completely different. Being a halogen, being reactive means they want to gain electrons. Okay? But that also be for, for metals, uh, for halogen. So guys, under your reactivity, you need to know how do each metals react with acids, cold water, and steam. Generally, your reactive metals up to calcium, they tend to react with all three because they like to be reacted. Understand? So therefore, potassium, silver, sil sodium, and calcium will react with acids, cold water, and steam. Clear? Now, what do they form when they react with acids? Metal plus acid. Salt plus hydrogen gas. Your, uh, hydrogen gas, your mesh, correct? What happens when they react with water or steam? If they react with water, they tend to form hydroxides. If they react with steam, they tend to form oxides. Okay? Next. Since they are very reactive, usually these reactive metals, how are they being extracted by? Yes, because why? They always want to become an ion. They want to bind with someone else. To break them up very hard, you need electricity to do that. Okay? Next, your mid tier metals. Your mid tier metals are not so reactive, but not that unreactive metals. They only react with acid. Some of them react with steam because it's hot enough. Generally, they don't react with cold water. You understand? And because they are mid tier, how do we usually get them out from as pure metals? How do we extract them? Extracted by, so the process is reduction. So usually your mid-tier metals, we reduce them from their ore to get out the pure metals. You understand? Lastly, the ones below your hydrogen, they don't react with hydrogen, so they don't react at all. Don't react with cold water, don't react with steam. Naturally, they don't react with anyone else. So they are usually found naturally. Don't even need to extract them out. Just need to purify them. That's all. Okay? So these are how we categorize the metals into a table for easy remembering. Now, just like halogen, your metals undergo displacement. All right? So the more reactive metals will always displace the least reactive metal from its aqueous solution. Clear? That's one thing you need to remember for metals. Huh? Next one, thermal decomposition. So if I have metal carbonates, now I need you guys to realize something. Your metal chapter, right, is actually split into two parts. Number one, forming my reactivity table. To form my reactivity table, I did experiments and reacted with this tree. And that's how I created this table. The second part, now that I know my table, what kind of experiment validates the table? That's why you have metal displacement, one experiment, thermal decomposition, another experiment, okay? So, when your metal carbonates decompose, what do they form? Metal oxide and carbon dioxide. Remember this, huh? When your metal carbonates decompose, they form metal, car uh, metal oxides and carbon dioxide. But one question, what happens if it's a metal nitrate? Decomposition of metal nitrate. Just to uh, X, bring it slightly further. 
By the way, decomposition is not the same as combustion. Uh. Combustion adds oxygen. Decomposition and combustion is two different things. Uh. Combustion reacts with oxygen. Decomposition purely just break down. So what happens when I decompose metal nitrates? If you look at the, the relationship above, you form metal oxide and carbon dioxide. So for this one, what do you guys form? Metal oxide. Nitrogen, dioxide, and oxygen gas. Okay, just an extension. Huh? I repeat, if it's a carbonate, it will form carbon dioxide and your metal oxide. If it's a nitrate, metal oxide, nitrogen dioxide and an additional oxygen gas understand okay just in case they do test you okay but if you were just talking about metal carbonate alone they always like to ask you about the reactivity series portion so what are the two metals that usually tend to not decompose is it the more reactive one or the least reactive one that don't decompose huh? do not decompose more reactive or less reactive? No, think about it. I remember I said more reactive uh, metals like to exist as a ion. If I'm a carbonate, am I already an ion? Yes, so do I die also want to break out with my carbonate? No, so you heat me up, I also don't want to break down. Understand? So I will want to exist as my carbonate. So sodium carbonate, potassium carbonate, they not easily decompose. Understand? Another word for this, if they say do not decompose, we say they are thermally stable. That's one another word that they might use in the exam. Okay? Thermally stable, meaning to say that in heat, they don't react. Clear? Next, the more reactive, the explanation is this, uh, the more reactive the metal, the higher the thermal stability of its carbonate. Therefore, you need a longer time in order for it to undergo thermal decomposition. Okay, clear? Okay, now the next reaction, guys, the next reaction to take note in metals is the reduction of metal oxide. Why do we want to reduce metal oxides? Because remember, this is one of the methods that we can use to extract all my precious metals here, correct? So how do we reduce metal oxides? To reduce metal oxide, I find something to react the oxygen with. And the two things would be, number one, carbon that comes in the form of Coke. Not your Coca-Cola, neither is it your drug that Coke, huh? okay? It is just a pure carbon charcoal kind of Coke. Understand? So charcoal is pure carbon. You add that in. Next, heating with hydrogen. So these two actually allows you to form your pure metal. Can you see that? So reduction of metal oxide is a method to form pure metals. You can do it with carbon or hydrogen. Clear? If it's carbon, guys, if it's carbon, you form carbon dioxide. Okay, if it's carbon monoxide, you will just form out the metal and excess carbon monoxide. But if it's hydrogen, you will form metal together with water vapor. Because you have to think about it, your reduction means I want to take away the oxygen. So I need something to react with the oxygen. Yeah? Okay, now the next part, extraction of metals is another experiment that they use to test the reactivity series. And in this case here, they realize that if it's below carbon in the reactivity series, they can be removed by using carbon. Means they are what? They are considered to be less reactive than carbon. So if you are less reactive than carbon, naturally displacement can take place. So your carbon can displace your metal up. But if let's say they are above carbon, that means they are, more, they are more reactive than carbon, then no choice, 
I will have to use electrolysis. So carbon in your, uh, your reactivity series helps you to determine who can be reduced, who cannot be reduced by carbon. Understand? Okay. Then that's where they extend the application to what? They extended the application to the blast furnace. So you all need to know the blast furnace process. Oh, then even better. Don't need to remember the blast furnace process really. Okay? Okay. Huh? Okay, now next one, guys. Rusting. Now, one important thing about rusting that you guys need to know is this. Huh? Rusting is only for iron or steel okay if it's other metal that reacts with oxygen i repeat uh, rusting is when iron or steel reacts with oxygen to form rust rust itself is a chemical formula hydrated copper three oxide but when we take a look at other metals reacting with oxygen we don't call it rusting for other metals, you need to use the word corrosion. I repeat, rusting is only for iron or steel. Other metals, we use corrosion. Okay? So when does rusting happen? Rusting happens when there is the presence of water and oxygen. Other metals undergo corrosion instead. No, cause no heat. So it's not combustion, it's a what process. Guys, guys, rusting is not combustion because although it reacts with oxygen, there is no heat involved. Huh? So what is rusting? Uh, what process is rusting called? Oxidation. Did you say condensation? <laughs> Oxidation. Understand? Okay. Okay, good. So very quickly, let's take a look at example 13 or question 13. I go through together with you guys this question. Okay, now for this question, they say in a zinc, in a laboratory experiment, zinc was added to the solution of zinc nitrate, nickel nitrate and copper two nitrate respectively. Now, this experiment is an exothermic reaction. What does exothermic reaction mean? Give off heat, correct. Now, how do you all remember exothermic is a uh, give off heat reaction? Exit, enter. Understand? Those of you guys who are K-pop fan, there's the EXO boy band, right? EXO. Then every time the girls see them, then what do they say? Very hot. Very hot. Yeah. Okay? So heat release. Understand? Okay? Now, the experiment is repeated with two other metals, guys. Nickel and copper. So, guys, if you realize... Obviously, I don't test the metal with its own metal salt. No reaction, no reaction, no reaction. Okay? Now, when zinc reacts with nickel, is zinc more reactive than nickel? Yes, because there is a reaction going on. Correct? Green solution turns colorless. Zinc is coated with silver uh, solid. So, now I know zinc is more reactive than nickel. That's the first clue I have. Now, is zinc more reactive than copper? Yes, zinc is more reactive than copper. Okay, next, nickel. Now let's take a look at copper. Copper, no visible change for all. What does that say about copper? Copper is the least reactive because it does not displace any of the metal. So, huh? why? Okay, so can zinc, can nickel react with zinc? Guys, can nickel displace zinc nitrate? So down here, what do we write? No visible change, correct. What about nickel and copper two nitrate? So what is the change here? First, what is copper two nitrate color? So we say, did somebody say green? 
it's here, blue. Blue solution turned what? Guys, blue solution turn what? What is nickel nitrate? Turn what? Turn green, correct? So blue solution turns green and nickel is coated with with a what? Huh? Carbonate. What is the product form here, guys? The product form here is nickel nitrate and nickel 2 nitrate as well as copper. What's the color of copper? Blue? Reddish brown. Or you can also say pink. Okay? For those who actually don't know the color of copper, Okay, wait ah, uh, before your copy. This is how copper looks like as a solid, reddish brown. Understand? Okay. Now, when is copper pink in color? Now, when is copper pink in color? When it's very pure. Understand? Your, what's a statue called? Statue of Liberty is actually a copper statue. It was supposed to be reddish brown. But somehow oxidation happened, made it green. Niche color. Understand? If you are those who are into fashion, you should know the Blake and the, do you know who's Blake Lively? Yeah. Then she wore that copper gown, bluish brown that turned yeah. She was trying to become copper, is it? Okay. Okay, so complete the table to predict the results. Now list the reactivity of metals. Can you tell me who is the one that's least reactive? Followed by followed by and then the last one. Magnesium, correct. Magnesium was just a random metal that they put it in. Okay, clear? So, I hope you guys have a better understanding of the question, uh, of the topics that we're going to be tested for. There is a lot more things for you to remember. Just today, we are talking about all the little details that the school don't really talk about. Understand? I've given you guys a summary of colours. Keep that and add on to it. It is not exhaustive enough. Yeah? MCQ, do it at home. The answer key I will release probably in one week time. Now. But do it before your... your uh, when's your WA by the way? Before CNY, anybody here? Before CNY? Or after CNY? Before CNY? Okay, then do it within four days. I'll upload it in four days. Okay, then...